Welcome to this MTech Access webinar. At MTech Access, we provide health economics and outcomes research and market access services from strategy through to implementation. Our unique NHS relationships guide and validate everything we do in the UK. We work with over 80 NHS associates to bring our pharmaceutical and medtech clients authentic insights into the NHS. We can help you answer key questions related to the NHS from how to communicate with integrated care systems, places and primary care networks to how to capture pathways of care. Get in touch today to discuss your market access goals. First though, I hope you enjoy the webinar. Hello everyone and welcome to this NHS Whispers session. I'm Phil Richardson and today our webinar is about integrating primary care. Uh, it's good to say that we've uh, today got a great mix of audience between industry and NHS and I'd like to particularly welcome our associates who play a key role in the work we do. Uh, for those who don't know any about uh, MTech Access, we're a specialist health economic, economics company uh, focused on outcomes and market access. Uh, uh, we've got a uh, substantial track record in delivery of expert technical services. Um, what I'd like to do today is welcome you specifically uh, to, uh, to our guest, Tim Goodson, who is the uh, Executive Director of Dorset Primary Care Alliance, and we're going to focus uh, today on integrating uh, primary care and the, and the future facing uh, view of how uh, some of the things that might be involved in that. So uh, welcome, Tim. Um, great to have you here. Afternoon, Phil. Yeah, good to be brilliant. here. Yeah, good. And, um, Maybe we could we could start with you just giving us a bit of an introduction about you, your role, um, and your responsibilities, and maybe a bit of your background to to just help everybody get orientated. Okay, uh, perhaps I'll start with a bit of my background. So, and obviously how we we came to know each other. So, previously I was the chief exec for Dorset Clinical Commissioning Group. So I did that for the whole sort of nine and a little bit years uh, of Dorset CCG. Uh, including being the uh, integrated care system lead for the last four, because we were we were one of the first wave one uh, pilots actually, so started all all the integrated care system sort of stuff off and going, and was was part of that right from the infancy. Uh, my actual sort of background by trade is uh, accountant, so I was uh, director of finance for nine years uh, prior to that in the primary care trust of various uh, forms and shapes across Dorset. So. I've uh, been in the NHS quite a long time and sort of board level uh, for a good 18 year, years of that career. Um, I'm now doing the sort of chief exec role for the Dorset General Practice Alliance. Uh, and I really started that when I sort of left the NHS in sort of October uh, and just sort of getting to know all, all the team there. I mean, obviously, I, I knew some of them from the CCG days as well. Uh, so still part of that sort of Dorset system. Brilliant. Thank, thanks, Tim. So. So for those who don't really understand what the Alliance is, I wonder if you could explain a bit more about that and uh, maybe if you, if you can explain, I'm not sure if you can or not, whether it fits into the what, what, what's the relationship with the ICB or the ICS and then I don't know, bring it to life a little bit about what happens on a day to day basis. Uh, so the, the, the General Practice Alliance came, came about really just towards the end of the clinical commissioning group. Um, so the practices I think were a, a bit nervous really, and a bit concerned in terms of you know going from a, a CCG, which is a was a general practice membership organisation, uh, with the GP chair, lots of GPs on the board. You know it was their organisation; they were the commissioners. Um, to effectively the integrated care board, where all of a sudden you've got the local authorities got seats on the boards, the provider trust got seats on the boards, and the the GPs or a representative from primary care only have one. So it was quite a big sort of shift there. Um, so they sort of felt it, it would be good to come together as a collective across Dorset uh, so they, they can maintain a, a sort of strong voice in the system. Uh, so all 73 practices in Dorset have signed a, a really just a memorandum of agreement uh, to form the Dorset General Practice Alliance so that they're all members of that. Um, and effectively, we've we put together uh, effectively a mini board to do that. So there's a Forbes Watson, who was the CCG chair, chairs it. I'm in as chief exec. Uh, we've got a HP a representative there. We've got a patient uh, representative there. 
uh, and then various GPs that represent the uh, sort of the east of Dorset, west of Dorset, uh, sit on it. Uh, and we spend a lot of time uh, also at the board with the primary care network leads come along. Uh, and it allows us really to be that sort of continued voice of uh, sort of general practice to sort of unite it and act, act as one. Um, and since doing that, the, the ICB actually has sort of recognised that as well. Um, so that the place on the ICB board for primary care, uh, effectively the, the general practice alliance chair takes that. Uh, and the other two GPs we've got, which uh, effectively his deputies, which one represents East, one represents West, uh, they also effectively attend the board as, as well. Uh, and then they they sit and represent general practice on our uh, on the ICB's primary care commissioning committee, uh, health and wellbeing boards, uh, the some of the place uh, groups that have come together. Um, so we're effectively being that sort of voice now for general practice in Dorset. Um, and I think people are using this as well. When you mentioned sort of day-to-day -day stuff, uh, there's somewhere to go. It's very difficult to get a view from general practice without going to 73 different organisations. In our case, um, which clearly doesn't really work. Whereas now, people are pointing them to to the alliance uh, and saying, well, actually, if you want to engage with general practice in Dorset, uh, effectively, there, there's some, somewhere to go. Uh, clearly, all all our GPs are still being GPs in their sort of day job. Uh, and myself and some of the other uh, people that sort of run it, we're, we're effectively part time as well. So it's uh, yeah, it's not it's not a big uh, sort of organisation, but it it is quite effective in terms of having sort of touch points with the GPs. Uh, we have a monthly board meeting where again the primary care uh, sort of clinical directors come, our members come, uh, and effectively now the the ICB now like likes to attend and other people like to attend because it's just a good place to engage with uh, sort of general practice. So. Um, we, we've had we've had to rush in attendance actually because uh, uh, everyone wants to suddenly come and engage with it. Um, so it, it, it's gone well. And we we work uh, hand in hand with the local uh, medical committee as well, the, the LMC, which is for us is Wessex, so that represents a bigger sort of patch. Uh, and we let them deal with sort of contractual stuff, what's in the contract and negotiations and, and things like that. We don't want to really be duplicating uh, what what they're doing. And we try and focus more on well, what's the actual general practice provider and provision side that's going on in Dorset. Um, and if some of the various sort of pathway groups are looking for a representative or think it'd be good to have a GP on there, and we, we, we see if we can sort of find somebody to fit that to keep uh, to keep a really sort of strong voice from general practice in uh, really in the decision makings and, and some of the thought processes and uh, innovation and stuff that's still going on in Dorset. Um, so it's it's not a trust in, in that sort of uh, context, but in many ways, I think people see the alliance kind of as well. There's the equivalent. If there was a general practice trust, that that's what it is. So let, let's let's sort of use them as we can. So that really touches on a number of things that I, some some of it would have come from the earlier ICS work that you touched on earlier about. Um, in integration was was quite a strong theme, and I think I think it's reasonable to to say that Dorset was seen as one of the leading integrators of uh, of uh, practice um, as a system. What what do you see as the 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 role going forward? Because I, I I hear you talk about the it's it's you didn't use one stop shop, but it feels a little bit more about a one stop shop to have the primary. The, G, the general practice conversation. There's clearly a wider conversation around uh, primary care. Um, is it is it working both ways? So more than just representation on the board. Is is it is, is something from the work that was done historically, or perhaps the work you're doing now, helping in integration of that expertise in a much more holistic way? I mean, Dorset's it's had a you know quite quite a long history really I, I think sort of work working together so it's not it's not saying it's been new really the, the integrated care system and even you know when, when we were approached to be you know sort of that wave one pilot you know that came off the back of the work that we'd already been doing so, so, so I don't think the switch in Dorset has been uh, such a sort of big bang or forcing people together um, I mean we, we certainly started in Dorset with well, same, same, same as everyone else actually you know long sort of battle scars really around uh, PBR and you know, long contract negotiations and disputes and things like that and you know it, it really just wears people down and you know after a while you know you sort of think well is 
is this really helping the delivery of any of the patient services or improving things or, or is it just a bit of a battle so you know we, we've been there done that kind of kind of got the t-shirts the same as a lot of other people um and, and i think really at the sort of the start of the it was really the start of the ccg uh, we wanted to try and do that in a sort of different way um and effectively we sort of we, we knew that the issues really were going to be around workforce finance and quality they were kind of our three sort of cornerstones um and up until that point there'd been so much focus on the finance because everyone was just you know going after everything that they can get so you know if, if, the, if the ccg gave out you know 99 percent of its funding everyone's fighting for that final one percent um and it's, it's probably not that different now but you know that, that's kind of how, how it sort of felt at the time so, so we came together in Dorset to agree a sort of a finance collaboration agreement. That, that was the first thing we did. Uh, was really that really set some of the rules how we wanted to engage on the finance, move the money around. Uh, we didn't want to start something if it created another cost pressure somewhere else, and we didn't want to do you know a new initiative unless there was cash releasing savings as opposed to theoretical. You know the patients have moved there, so that saves X because this is cheaper than Y. We said, yeah, but can you actually take staff out of the one? Have you still got to run it because it's still a service? So, you know, when we got that agreed, um, that really allowed us then to focus on, well, what do you want to do on top of that then as a, as a, as a system? And, you know, people then really did want to look at some of the difficult uh, things that we hadn't done in Dorset uh, because we hadn't had the joined up approach. I mean, we refer to it as integration, but for me, it's really, you know, are everyone actually joined up in what they're doing? And, you know, as soon as we sort of got a stable basis, I think, on the financial side of things, people were happy then to say, actually, let, let's look at some of the big ticket areas. And you know, as yourself knows, we, we we started the clinical service review then, um, which was a, a long journey, which ended up in the uh, implementing and, you know, getting capital funding for a new sort of A&E, maternity units, children unit, community investment, mental health, acute care pathway, all sorts of things. But I think what it what it really did, which you, know, you don't really see because effectively the buildings and the stuff around that are easy to see, but it did get everyone uh, really on the same side uh, and it got people, I, I used to describe as walking in the same direction. Um, and that really was the legacy, I, I think, of that piece of work. And we, we started to put people, the, we put them, they started to come, come together themselves really, in terms of just in the same room, um, so I remember down at uh, it was West Haven Hospital down, down in Weymouth, and it was yeah, you know, it, it was no more complicated than actually teams coming together in the room. And if the phone went in that room, anyone from the team would answer it, whether they were from you know, the NHS or social care or uh, you know some of the voluntary sector, and they started to take ownership and work as it together. Um, and and that sounds really simple, but it doesn't really happen. You know, ev everyone I, th I think. Prior to that, I got very much stuck in the uh, sort of isolation and different organisation uh, sort of boundaries around them. Um, and, and I think some of the work we, we did earlier in Dorset was say, no, that's not the way we want to do it. Is it is it really best for the patient, the overall system? If it is, uh, let, let's start to go through and do that. And it, it started to trigger almost a series of events that then followed. So as we were going through the journey, uh, nationally, the vanguards came up, and we, we had three acute trusts there. We had Bournemouth, Paul, and uh, Dorset County, and you know they decided themselves to become a vanguard to start sharing some of the uh, pathways and doing things together. Um, so that they then jumped ahead of where we were at with some of the stuff that we were doing, and it was good to see that. Uh, we saw the general practices starting to merge and come together again to get a bit more resilience there. So. When we started the CCG, we had 100 GP practices, uh, and when we uh, finished, we had 73. Um, so that's, and if you think those that went went with another practice, you know, almost half of the practices in one way or another had sort of come together and sort of gone up at scale to to, to do that. Um, and I think some some of that sort of collective, you know, acting as one and starting to come together as one. That probably was the main sort of legacy or the platform that was created just through some of the on-ground work that was all sort of going together. Um, similarly, the, the, the clinicians, when we were, we were doing it, you know, what, what's stopping you do this? And there, there was very much a view of, well, if you can't see each other's uh, record with a patient, it's very difficult to do some of the integration stuff. 
Um, and that, that led to the Dorset care record being created, uh, where we started, well, okay, let's, let's join up so we can see each of the, what was then the three different acute trusts, the, uh, the community trust, let's get, it's at both sides can see the, the general practice, care record as well and uh, social care could then link into that and see it and then let's have those on um, and I think last month there was uh, I don't know if you know there's just over a hundred thousand record views in last month alone uh, so it's going to massive hit rate and you sort of think well how can you go from not having that system to a hundred thousand records being accessed a month now uh, so that shows the difference in actually let, let's let's see the whole picture for this patient not just uh, what we do in terms of you know our, our department or our, our services um, and I, I think that really was the journey we sort of went on in Dorset just trying to get that together and others have been on similar sort of journeys as that um, but we were probably slightly ahead of where some other places were in that and uh, that's why we were invited to be one of the you know one of the pilots for it and and I think some of that you know so that journey is, is still going on now and we sort of described it really, you know, we reached base camp and we were, we're at the infancy of that and the, the rest of the mountain is still there to climb in front of you. Um, but it really did bring together all the different uh, sort of clinicians and services and start to park as a part of the organisational alliances. So that if it's the right thing to do, let, let's just do it because we're, you know, so we're walking in the same direction. And uh, that's really how it sort of started. So that, that's that's really great, and and as you say, there was a um, a lo lot of good work done to to almost make the move through into an integrated care board, the, just the next logical step. But have have you have you noticed having having gone from where 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 the whole thing started at the let's start at the CCG through to the end of the CCG and now the ICB? Have you noticed a has there been a change in the role for primary care? Or have you, did you, was there an inflection point at the ICB or, or, or have you felt it's, it's pretty much has continued on the trajectory and just in an, a continued improvement? Well, I, I guess the, the, the structure has changed, hasn't it? So as I said, you know, the, the CCG yeah. was very much a membership organisation and the GPs were there with commissioner hats on. And we, we were quite, um, we were quite insistent on sort of saying that to them, you know, you, you've got to park your provision hats as a, gen, as a GP. You're here to commission on behalf of the whole system and the whole pathway. So I think the, the big change with the ICB is now they sit there really as a general practice with a provider hat on. So they're very much more vocal on you. Know, this is what general practice can do or primary care can do within uh, this sort of pathway or this system. And these are the things we can't do or what our limitations are, what our challenges are. So they, they kind of sit there and I said, I don't really want to say they're a trust, but you know, together there are about 3,000 people working Dorset's general practices. Um, we've got 130 odd sites, uh, and the vast majority, 90% of the patient contacts, happen in general practice. Um, so really, they they wanted that to come together as a you know, people need to recognise this that actually, you know, we've got all these staff and we've got all these sites and we see all this huge amount of patient activity. You know, we're as important effectively as some of the NHS trusts where it's easier to touch and see and you know people more familiar with that so um, I, I think that role has changed from the you know the commissioner to the provider uh, probably a bit more bullish really in terms of general practice and the, and the position it's at um, the essence of I suppose some of the, the, the primary care and what they do on a day-to-day -day hasn't changed um, but, but I think they view it with a slightly different sort of hat on now um, and of course what we're going to see uh, well what's effectively just happened sort of this year as well. If I take the wider primary care, uh, some of the stuff that NHS Dorset was doing has now come back effectively to the ICB around the sort of dentistry and the uh, opticians and community pharmacists, um, which the CCG didn't do, and became a bit you know, sort of out of sight, out of mind because we you know we weren't involved in that pathway, and uh, that that always felt a bit a bit odd really because you know these are very local services that you know you need to effectively make the whole system work appropriately. Um, so, so I think for Dorset, the change wasn't enormous. I think other places around the country perhaps would have had a bigger change where you know, they, they weren't so used to uh, doing everything sort of together and taking collective decisions. Um, but the, the ICB board in Dorset and certainly the, 
um, the Internet Care Partnership endorse it looks similar to what it did with the CCG. You know, we, we were keen to have lots of partners around the table, uh, particularly at the partnership. You know, we, we already had you know, the local authorities were there, fire was there, police was there. Um, so, you know, it, it wasn't a massive difference there. Um, but the fact it's now laid down in statute and right, okay, it gives that some authority to you've got to write the strategy and you know, the ICB board's got to implement that for the NHS part of it. Um, it's probably put much more structure around it. And we were doing it through really a, a coalition of the willing was the sort of the, the, the term that was being sort of used. And, you know, quite a lot. I think Rob Webster might have come up with that, actually, part of the, you know, the, the ICS Wave 1 group. And that's how it felt. You know, people were there because they wanted to be there. But equally, people could walk away at any point. Uh, whereas now that has changed. Obviously, you know, it's a statutory requirement. Uh, so there's a lot more sort of... Um, you know sort of power behind the icb really you know they, they get mu they've got much more control in that respect than the ccg had uh, I, I would say but, but i think what's interesting what we just said is um it really shines a spotlight on general practice particularly at scale is is now an organized or becoming more organized meaningful operation in its own right and, and that that's a dyna that's a shift in dynamics to in the conversation because historically everything uh, both both within the NHS um, within N NHS policy leadership and within industry has all been hospitals everything is a hospital conversation you know the BBC all of their pieces on NHS are outside A and E with ambulances buzzing because that buzzing around in the background and that's where the NHS happens but but you you touch on I think really important point here that it, it, different, different. I've heard different quotes, but anywhere between 90 and 95 percent of everything happens outside the hospital. So why, mm -hmm. why are we only talking a tiny bit about that, and and everything else is focused on hospitals? So, so, but I think you, I think that's really important um, message to to come from this. The, 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 the more organising around the provider capability, capacity, innovation, skills, ability that general practice has and now the integrating with wider primary care that that really is where the conversation needs to be isn't it well as you, as you said you know I, I i hear different percentages as well but they all seem to be in the 90 percent plus in terms of you know your, your total number of contacts are going to be in in primary care and you know if, if i think about it and most other people think about it you know i i see the gp the optician and the dentist far more often than I'm in a you know, acute hospital for some outpatient appointment, although you know, we, we all have touch points of those in life. Um, for the vast majority of people, it's going to be a primary care, it's going to be your most regular sort, sort of contact yet. Um, you know, we do seem a bit consumed in the NHS with the, the larger um, sort of acute hospitals and that side of things. Um, whereas really, if you want to make you know the biggest changes you need to make it where you know the most amount of care is provided which is outside of the hospital it's, it's in the community and it's in the primary care settings to uh, take that forward yeah so no i think you're right and i think it's interesting for for industry uh, in in its approach and thinking about what its strategy is and the model uh, of engagement that it works to to perhaps reflect on uh, on that change, so what, what, while whilst it might look subtle, is is actually quite significant in the move from a uh, primary care in a disparate federated sense, commission focused to some degree with provision in the background to provision being at the headline really and and truly engaging with population. And and I think if we if we look at um, you know the Hewitt review is is an example in this. The, the next logical step to integrated neighbourhood teams. Um, how, how how does that figure in your current thinking, or 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 what you might be doing, or might already have done in in the Dorset system? Yeah, so so, so I I think the Patricia Hewitt review pr pretty much you know hit the nail on the head with most of the issues that that she raised there. Um, and you know we, we, we've been asked to do a, a similar review in, in Dorset looking at the sort of sustainability of general practice in Dorset and you know no surprise we're we're finding the same things being fed back to which you know she's pulled out and the uh, the fuller report pulled out as well around some of the integration but particularly the, the Hewitt review 
they're calling out some of the complexities around uh, you know, some of the QOF arrangements, the R's arrangements, the investment fund stuff, the bureaucracy around that, uh, you know, the form filling in, uh, the fact that general practice estates not had you know, enough investment really and you know, keep creating new roles for people that uh, are almost you know, complementary to GPs but not GPs. So, you know, have a, let's, let's move into practices, you know, sort of physios and pharmacists and paramedics. So, you know, they all need to be housed somewhere. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's not enough space to do this sort of service and there's not enough, um, uh, there's not a freedom around some of the funding that goes with it. So, so I, I think she really did pull that out and call, call it pretty well, actually. Um, there's not yet, I don't believe there's yet been a formal response to it. I think we're still awaiting that. So it'd be interesting to see, yeah, you know, what do they run with or what don't they run with to do that? Um, and yeah, wait, wait for that space. Um, and, in, and in terms of some of the integrated stuff and some of the, you know, the neighbourhood teams, um, which perhaps was a bit more where, you know, Claire Fuller and her report was coming from in terms of, you know, can you really pull all these different providers together because you could really make a difference? Uh, I, I still think we're, 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 we're beginning to see some of that, but I think we're still very much at the early stages of that, really. Um, you know, the ICBs have come together, aren't they? they're going through a uh, effectively the, the norming and forming stage in terms of their sort of uh, sort of journey at the moment and that takes a lot you know it's a lot of organizational change and turbulence there um, for everyone involved in it so, so I, I think it's, it's only now you'll start to see them settle down a bit and start to look more in the okay what can we now do the next stage in some of some of these neighborhoods and getting in there and different um, different areas are going to have different views on that because some of, some of the ICBs are much different in their size. You know, the size differential is is vast, really. Mm -hmm. um, so, so some will talk about the, the neighbourhoods at you know sort of fifty thousand population, sort of PCN sort of population. Um, whereas you know when I talk to some of our GPs, they're much smaller than that. They're, they're sort of saying, well, surely the neighbourhood is you know the local population just of this practice or almost a council ward size. So mm -hmm. you can find you're talking at totally different purposes depending who you're actually engaging with. But but I think uh, if, but I, if you if you can engage with the, with the local public, the volunteer groups, the you know some of the sort of associations there, and get people really taking ownership of some of those issues, you can really achieve great things. And I think if if ICBs and ICSs can tap into that and can really pull that off. That really would be their their legacy, I I, I think, in, in terms of that, because we've never quite done that in the past. You know, the, the, the NHS will do things you know, in the NHS, and it'll, it'll, it'll progress stuff, and you know, go forward, it, you know, kind of regardless of whether it's CCGs, PCTs, uh, ICBs. But having all the system partners around the table, if you can then engage with much more smaller local communities and get stuff much sort of co-designed and owned by them. Uh, that that's a real uh, that'd be a real benefit really, and there are some around the country. You know, the the w Wigan was really good. The Wigan deal, um, people sort of looked that up. How they really did engage with local populations around some of the services you know the council was particularly sort of providing. You know, it's a different way of looking at it, and and I think the ICBs and IC ICSs really could tap tap into that, and I think to do that, get that real ownership it needs to mean something to the people that live there and I think you only get that at the smaller neighborhood level you know you, I think you get it I mean for me uh, Dorset I mean okay, I, you know, I live in Dorset but th does it mean much not not a great deal um, whereas if you talk about you know my local ward or you know the local town um, and places you sort of know and go to that you're much more interested in that so uh, I, I think there's hope for that but it, it it's in its infancy would be my, my take at the moment but it, but it does feel like it's a logical step, doesn't it, from from where everybody is currently? And if I think if we just couple it with the with your comments earlier about um, uh, general practice as a provider and being able to 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 have an integrated view, I'd be, be interested to get your thoughts on industry. So so here, let me just share with the the paradigm that I experience in talking to um, different industry organisations both the early startups in the medtech space through to more established pharma companies. 
the the old model of working were, was really down a product uh, focus, down to an indip- individual therapy or treatment, and then maybe as wide as a therapeutic area. And the launch of ICBs and ICSs has created what feels like really key points of focus and lots of energy and discussion happening about how to access the ICB or the ICP to to understand what's happening and to engage and influence uh, and partner. But if I overlap overlap that with what you've just talked about, um, feels like there might be a bit of a risk everybody's heading in the wrong direction. If, if, if in fact, um, the the primary care in its broader sense, as you touched on earlier, and, and really getting to where the patients are, um, that that's that that feels like maybe it's time for a bit of a rethink. So just be interested in your take on, you know, if you were advising me as to what what I should be talking to industry about, uh, particularly in the in heading in this way about integration of primary care or the integrated of systems, what what would your top tips be? Um, I, I I suppose at the moment the thing that everyone's struggling a bit with is is workforce. Um, so you know, there's the, the figure seems enormous in terms of the number of the vacancies in in uh, you know the, the NHS uh, general practice. Dorset's actually quite good actually. It's got a I think it's one GP for every about two thousand in terms of population, whereas the average is about two and a half thousand, and some are nearly three thousand in terms of people to GP ratio. So so workforce is the biggest pressure I think in the whole system, even social care anything. So anything that effectively helps that workforce or saves time or makes the workforce that we've got effectively more productive that's what people will will look at so solutions around you know probably time is the is the key isn't it i I think you know this this product or you know this treatment this saves time so you know you you require fewer visits you know they don't need to keep coming seeing you or it cuts the pathway down or it removes this repetitive nature of it. I, I think that's where people will see it because, you know, at the moment, um, particularly when I speak to some of the GPs, you know, there's, there's various funding pots that they can see, mm. but they almost don't, well, they, they don't go after the funding because they've not got a workforce to deliver it. And they know yeah. if they get it, they can't recruit people. Um, so, yeah, th- things that focus around the, the time saving is where I would point, point people towards. Okay. And, Particularly, I, I suppose the ultimate one of that is around some of the self-care. Uh, you know, and I think people want to help themselves. You, know, you don't really want to have to go to, you know, interact. I don't think we, with some of these services if you don't need to. So, you know, we've seen huge increase, haven't we, in some of the, you know, sort of your self-help apps and you know, sort of websites and stuff like that. But equally, you know, I mean, I've got a blood pressure monitor at home you know in the drawer sort of thing so you, you can take that if you want and the stuff you can do on your phones and things um so anything that helps around some of self-care i think is, is is a way to go and people will be interested in that and primary care will certainly be interested in that you know you don't need to come to the practices if you can do it at home and some of the um some of the technology around that and equally some of the some of the stuff that sits around some of the prevention and the prom- promotion of some of the preventions and and, and stuff because you know we are used to it you know people do brush their teeth don't they and take various supplements and watch their weight and stuff um but but i think that that's an area that a lot of people get much much more interested in um and, and i think that again is an area for you know sort of industry and stuff primary care particularly will be interested in well this is a prevention to stop them coming to sort of see me or us or needing us so much this allows them to actually self-care at home this allows them to treat at home um, so we try and move stuff that perhaps previously you, you had to go to your, you know, your acute hospital for, will move into the community, stuff you used to go to the community hospital, uh, potentially move into uh, you know, just your general practice can do that now, and stuff the general practice used to do, well actually you can do that yourself at home. And that constant sort of shift that way, um, I, I think that's, that's always of interest, I, I, I think, within the NHS. Right. Brilliant. Thanks, Tim. That, that, that's, I think that's really helpful and some good good points for people to to perhaps ponder uh, as they pull, pull together their plans. Um, if we look at um, uh, the, the traditional groupings of acute uh, primary care, general practice within it, the voluntary sector, uh, community sector, it, is the Alliance looking at anything about culture 
and and how and how culture might might be might need to be nudged or or supported or or, or something. I'm thinking about just digging under the you know the people behavior values piece rather than the structuring bit. And have, have you have you considered anything in that space? Um, I I wouldn't say we've proactively done anything in it, but we you know we are still quite young. Really. I mean, we only sort of formed in uh, October, but I think but people are. Quite well aware quite well. in terms of um, culture eat strategy for breakfast, doesn't it? You know, was it uh, Peter Drucker? I think was uh, sort of credited with that. And the more you look at these things, the more I think that that is true. You know, you, you can have the best plans in the world, but if you've got different groups that just don't want to work together and they just don't want to get on and do that, you know, it, it doesn't happen. And, and I think one of the things that um, general practice has been good at. You know, the, the, the GPs are, are well respected and, you know, they, they've got a vast knowledge of the whole pathway and the whole system. And, you know, I think that does put them in a, in a good position to actually bring people together to give a more um, sort of holistic or overview of the patient and the patient journey, uh, which starts to actually you know tackle some of the cultural issues. Um, and I, I know some of our, our uh, GPs were just meeting with some of the uh, some of the consultants in uh, one of our acute trusts the other week, and they they were quite surprised in terms of just how specialised now some of the consultants are. Um, I think one of them said, "No, I only really do you know, sort of j just above the knee and just below the knee." You know, that's how specialist it is. Mm. Um, so, so when they if they see anything else wrong with the patient, you know, they're, they're effectively referring back to general practice again, and it's kind of, and the you know the, the, the GPs were well, but you're also a doctor, you know, you, you really. You know, you need to look at the whole patient and consider everything they present with, not just the, the specialist area. And we've probably moved too far, you know, sort of away from that. Um, and I think that's where the GPs pretty much get the respect, really, and, and they can get through some of these cultural issues because they they do tend to see the, the the patient more and you know know much more what's going on with them or their family. You know, we talk about the, you know, the cradle to grave, don't we? Which is becoming increasingly difficult for a you know, GP to have that relationship with individual patients, but they they, they will have it with those. I, I think that um, perhaps the more complex patients or uh, have more multiple conditions and tend to, you know, they tend to see them a lot more. They tend to get to know them much, much more. Uh, so it does put them in a really good place to, to effectively do that. Um, and, and I think that, you know, it, the, the GPs just have to respect, I think, really, of the, you know, the people uh, you, you get a different response from the media to GPs, you get a different response when counsellors are talking to them, you get a different response when people in the hospital talk to them. So I, I think they can bridge some of those cultural sort of differences, really. Um, and, and I think the, the alliance can then do a similar thing within sort of the GP community. So we're kind of a safe place to have a you know, safe sort of zone for conversations with some of the practices may have with a, a fellow GP or with the alliance that they may not feel comfortable having uh effectively with say the icb or the primary care team that's sort of managing them um so that i think that that enables us to be you know quite useful in that respect and and the same you know because we are somewhere where we can speak for that general practice voice um you know we can engage and then work with the, the, the trust the voluntary sector um because we're a body that can represent general practice so you know it, it enables some of the some of the relationships really to be built, but there's yeah, there, there's no magic bullet really to cracking some of the cultural things. Um, I, I I think they just all get built on relationships, and up until now it's been difficult to see well where is the general practice relationship. But I think with some of the, with with the alliance and other GP federations and the primary care networks that are coming, uh, you can effectively see well actually you can have an ongoing relationship with them, and they. Yeah, there's a bit more stability there and they represent a bit bigger area um, and the relationships I, I, I think will build the, build the culture. So, and that, that, that's a very strong point isn't it? I think the uh, understanding how the rewiring of relationships has happened through through this ICB change and then the role the Alliance plays around it, that, that feels like a force for good to, to, help, to help get alignment. And, and, and one thing I'd be just interested in talking to you about re, related to that alignment is 
is about research and innovation. So what you know, my, my, my experience in the system has been uh, lo lots of really good talent happening, uh, talent in, in, uh, in general practice for both research and innovation and some good individual connections. But, but is, there, is, there a, is that something that also will benefit from this clearer relation, line of relationships and, the, uh, and a way of working? Well, I, I hope so, um, and I think particularly some of the you know, GPs, it, I, I think they tend to like some of the uh, innovation stuff um, and new ideas and sort of technology because they can very quickly see, is there a benefit to that? And can I see that benefit? And can I see how that's going to help me? I, I think they, they see those connections uh, almost, almost instantly, really. Mm -hmm. And when, when you get down to an individual GP practice, uh, you know, they can be very quick to change because they're, they're generally they are relatively small businesses. Uh, so they are light foot. So, you know, the ability to change what they can do and actually implement something called be an early adopter or try something is pretty, pretty good, really, uh, at that sort of level. Um, I think the thing that the new system, particularly the ICB or you know, the wider ICS partners sort of bring to the table now, everyone is around the table. Um, yeah, the, the NHS can be quite a difficult you know, market to break or get some of those conversations going with because it, it it's massive, isn't it? And you think, oh, we'll talk to the NHS. And it's like, well, crikey, you know, there, there are hundreds of ships in this flotilla. And, you know, the NHS isn't, the, people talk about the oil tanker, don't you? You've got to try and turn the oil tanker. And it's like, no, no, the NHS is a flotilla of thousands of ships that are going along. And it's very difficult to actually get them all going in the same direction. and uh, you can't just talk to one and it happens. I think the ICBs and the ICSs probably help that because there's more people around the table and it's it's put the NHS into quite nice bite-sized chunks. So if you want to change something, you know, if you can get a big national change, you know, that's great, isn't it? But it, it's they're fairly rare and less likely. But you could do some research or partnership up with effectively an you know, an, an ICB or a GP Federation or a primary care network. And, you know, you could do something much easier at that sort of scale. Mm -hmm. And when things work in the NHS, particularly in general practice, if, if there's something in general practice working really well, it actually, the, the message on that goes around very quickly. Um, yeah. and, and you remember in Dorset, you know, we, we had a number of GP uh, sort of systems and then, you know, they, they like one system and, you know, they, they suddenly all, all went with the with the same one. Uh, we, we didn't really push that. It suddenly happened so that this works and we can see yours record, you can see ours, off it goes. And, um, yeah, yeah it, it, it really gathered its, its momentum on its own. Um, and a, a series of quick decisions in individual practices can happen actually quite quickly. Whereas trying yes. to get everyone to do everything together can take a long time, which is, is sort of the same it's sort of the opposite thing, isn't it? But actually, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, they, they can be quick to change, and, and I think, yeah, you, you, you're a certain innovation. Yes, smaller bite-sized chunks, you can suddenly get momentum, and then it can suddenly spread very quickly. There's certainly a lot of uh, organisations interested in doing uh, proof of value uh, pilots, uh, and and I think from what you've described, the the changing shape of general practice and then and wider primary care. Is starting to head that way, isn't it? To be to 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 probably want to do similar things, and I and I just wonder if we just scale it back to look at some of the big data bits, the things like population health management, health inequalities, health economics, the value of change. It feels like that also could work quite well in a bite-sized chunks in primary care networks or integrated network teams, or if it was scalable to a an alliance level type of conversation. What's your sense about that? Yeah, I mean, D Dorset was a, a wave one of the population health management and yeah, some of the GPs that got involved in that absolutely loved it. I mean, they, you know, they would talk incredibly passionately about, you know, the, the richness of the information that they're currently, they're currently getting that produces them. And I, and I think the thing that we did perhaps different than some of the other ones, so rather than taking all the existing data and sort of showing you this is what your population looks like and you know this is how many of these you've got and there's how you compare and benchmark because there is just loads of that in the NHS. You know, 
we were quite clear in terms of we need to be able to drill back down to the patient. So effectively, for it to be of use to the you know the, the GP, it's no good knowing that we're an outlier in this area unless you can see well which are the patients that are causing us to be an outlier, so they can actually do something about it. And you know we we spend a lot of time uh, trying to get that right and say okay, so everyone can see the big picture, everyone can get the variants, but effectively if you're the clinician, you've got the password, you can go down into your practice and you can see which patients it is. So you can actually have the conversation with those patients. And I think the, the ability to manipulate data like that, that those that are now running with that, you know, they, they absolutely love that really. And, and it makes a big difference to them. And I know um, some of the stuff we looked at earlier on was, was doing a, effectively just, just a simple grid really in terms of these patients have got, you know, hugely complex multiple healthcare needs, but actually, we don't spend much resource on them. You know, why is that? And then you had another group of patients that didn't really have much in terms of complex medical needs, it was very low medical needs really, yet we were spending a fortune on them in terms of you know, the number of times they were coming back in and the interventions and you know, the frequent calls. So why is that? And the fact that they could get back to those patients, they knew who they were, you, know, you could start to add real intelligence to it in terms of, yeah, the ones that don't really have the medical need, but we keep on seeing them, they've not got the social support around them, really. You know, they've not got yeah. the family or the, you know, the, the, the partners passed away. Or I remember in one case, you know, the, the dog had recently died and all of a sudden, yeah, you know, you've, you've got loneliness and the person's not getting out much and they get more you know, anxieties coming in and all those things. So, you know, and I, and I think in most cases, it's not the clinical need that really is yeah. the support need. It's, it's much it's much more around the, uh, you know, the whole uh, social and you know, family support that sits around it that actually provides it. And we were seeing this with some of the some of the data stuff because we could pinpoint the individual person. Um, the area I think we struggle with um, on, on some of the you know the big data and the business intelligence stuff is it can just be overwhelming. Um, so you can give these tools to GPs and they'll, they'll, they'll look at you in terms of. Well, when am I going to get time to go through that? You know, we've got huge workforce challenges. You know, we, we've got people, you know, trying to get you know better access all the time. You know, it's finding the time to go through it. So I think any any new technology that you know cuts that bit out and it does the predictive algorithms or it does the AI, which that actually then pinpoints actually this patient is effectively a, a ten out of ten on the risk score for this. And they've not got to go through a whole sort of, you know, sort of drill down and variation analysis. It it just comes out. So it gives you the list. Really, you should you should call these in and link these to these conditions. They're high risk for that. Um, and we, we do that with some of us, some of our stuff, don't we? you know, some of the uh, high risk for certain cancers and stuff. We do it. But but you could do that across you know, loads of conditions. And, and I think some of the some of the data now it's there, isn't it? Some of the care records are there and. Yeah, some of some of the look into all those things and genomics and stuff can pull that out, but you could make it real for GPs at that level if you can do it. That takes out the the, the churn of having to go through it. And it literally tells you, you know, this patient number, high risk of this, and you could link, you know, possible things you should you should look at. And then I think GPs will, will pull them in. You know, they they will pull in to look to look at those patients and have a conversation. No, and, I, and I think that, I mean, that sounds like a really sensible way forward, doesn't it? Once everybody has confidence in what they, the list they're given as being a, a as good a list as they would do had they got time to work it through, that's often been the, been the challenge. But if you were to sort of spend, expand that out, you talked about prevention a bit earlier, but if we think about wider determinants of health, um, sort of the Michael Marmot view and many, many people thinking and supporting that, you, could could you extend your thought your thought process then to to look at some some other some other things? So just give you a, an example. You know, should we close the should the council close a swimming pool when if you had a model which perhaps connected those things together, it might show you the downstream effect on somebody in later life not having had access to it. I don't, I, obviously, that's just a, a made up example. But is there is there some connection between wider determinants and what you've just said? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, really, I mean, you know, the whole you know, the reason the public health teams moved across into the local authorities was to have that influence 
you know, at the heart of the councils on the wider determinants around some of the you know, housing, employment, open spaces, you know, because public health used to sit within the NHS trying to you know, promote some of the prevention stuff within the NHS. And it's like, well, actually, the NHS is more about, you know, some of the cures and treatments. If you want to make the biggest difference, it is going to be effectively on those wider determinants. I mean, they're, they're your 80, 90 percent of what really affects someone's life expectancy. Um, yeah, so public health moved into the councils to do that, start those conversations with, you know, the councillors, the health and wellbeing boards, to influence those budgets to, to do that um, and, and effectively take that forward. You know, yes, the NHS can increase life expectancy through some of the you know, medical breakthroughs some of the drug breakthroughs and stuff. But that's really incremental, I think, compared to some of the non-medical stuff. Um, yeah. You know, if, if you look at some of the most deprived areas, that's that's where we're getting, you know, the lower life expectancy. That's where we're getting, um, you know, some of the frequent people just keep coming back. And, you know, that is going to be the same area that's going to be of you know, most interest, really, to, you know, some of the housing officers, some of the low income stuff. Uh, you're going to get, you know, the police will be interested in some of the areas in terms of some of the crime rates there. Uh, same with the fire. Everyone's looking at the same sort of grouping. So the you know, the, the integrated care system particularly, um, you know, if you've got a new scheme to start, start it there. You know, look at, well, where are some of the, you know, some of the things that Marmot was sort of saying, or even, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, just, you know, your shelter, your food, your security, yeah. stuff like that. You know, homeless people, their life expectancy is half that of the normal age. Um so, you know, you need to look at well, where are they? Where can we make the biggest difference? It's going to be there and it's not going to be through NHS uh, interventions. Mm. It, it's going to be through, you know, th th those other areas which are much more local authority influenced and linking in with some of the, uh, you know, some of the voluntary sector, charitable sector that work in those, those areas. You know, some, some of the you know, j just the, you know, the residents in, in those areas as well. That, that's where you make the big, the big difference. And the. You know, the, I, the ICSs in particular bring together all, pretty much all really, of the, the big anchor institutions of the public sector in that place. And if they all focus together at the same, at the same sort of area with the same thing we're trying to achieve, you know, they, they can make a difference there, absolutely. You know, we, yeah. we can you know, buy locally, start each new initiative in, in the same area, you know, try and recruit and get you know, employment going there, try and invest there, and you can slowly turn, uh, you know, the, the dial in some of those areas. And yeah, I, I think um, you yeah, know the ICS is and the you know, the ICB is very well placed to do that. Uh, and and, I, and it's 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 an interesting thought for for industry, isn't it? Because there is the if if we have uh, truly have the patient at the heart, or really the the person at the heart, where we're trying to help them not become a patient. Um, would be one ideal scenario. There, there's something about how, how organisations organizations might want to think about engaging in the ICS conversation as well as more locally into a into a therapeutic area or similar. That that sounds like that might be something worth considering. Yeah, I, I think a lot of the um, you know a lot of the whole person. Uh, sort of very rather you know yeah you know, we, we tend to talk about patients don't we but really it's the population isn't it it's, it's the person and you know what would you want and how would you want your family to be treated uh and what do you want for your area around all the all the services uh you know we, we're all the same in, in in terms of that you know we we want the best for our area and our and our families um and that's not necessarily if you want to improve the health i say it's not necessarily a conversation with the nhs you want you know, it's a conversation for, you know, others and particularly local authorities spend the vast amount of the local authority budget will be spent on adult social care and, you know, children's social care. That's, that's the lion's share by a huge amount. Um, yeah, people don't necessarily associate their local authorities with that. You know, people tend to think yeah. of you know, roads and potholes and libraries and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. biggest chunk of money is going to be spent on the social care by, by on some way. Yeah, yeah, no, no, the, it's a, that's a good, good reminder. So, so, 
So but my last question, which um, obviously I couldn't resist uh, you having admitted earlier as being an accountant, and now we've just touched on, on money. It, it, how, how, where do you see the flow of funding go? Because there was a traditional model where CCG was one, specialised commissioning stayed with the NHS England, uh, joint funding went through the Better Care Fund to across that blue line between local authorities uh, and CCGs. There were personalised healthcare budgets, uh, and, and and now the ICB is coming into play. Um, uh, and a sense that will all the money go to the ICB, and then the, and then that will decide. So so where the money flows is different, but we've still got uh, primary care contracts, the new primary care contracts that's that's just in circulation. But what, what's your sense of where that where the funding flow will be going forward? Um, so I guess at, at, at a national level, I think we're still going to see the you know the, the leveling up agenda. So you know the areas with you know the lower life expectancy and the the higher sort of deprivation. You know we're seeing money moving into those areas, and, and that's been happening uh, you know for the last probably sort of ten years now. It's only happened throughout the CCG's life lifespan. Um, and I, I think that that will continue because um, when you look at the you know the, the picture of the country as a whole, it, it needs needs to happen. Um, mm -hmm. That will make things difficult for those areas uh, like Dorset and quite most of the southwest, really, where where you've already got a higher life expectancy, which means you have a higher elderly population uh, who actually use the you know, the majority of the, the the funds tend to go on you know, you know the elderly. So you know, that you're struggling because you're spending the money already. But I don't think that will change this levelling up in terms of, you know, we've got to get life expectancy up elsewhere. So at a national level, I think I think that will continue into th those types of areas. Um, I, I think that the desire seems to be there, doesn't it, to move more, low, more of the funding at a local level down into the ICB. So, you know, we've seen the, you know, the dentistry and the optoms and stuff come back. Um, and I think that's I think that was right. It, it, I, I always remember thinking it, this is very odd that they're moving away from the CCGs. You know, they're all, they always were in the PCTs, uh, and it was moving away because it was like, but these are part of the services that are de delivered locally. You know, the, the teams here know the local dentists and the, the towns and the villages and stuff, and these are high street services. So you know, to move them to a more regional procurement seemed seemed odd. Really, I, I always felt that. Um, so moving the primary care stuff back to local, I, I think, is you know, is the right the right move, and uh, I, I think you'll see much more focus on that because it, it'll suddenly be you know, very much uh, in the face of the IC ICBs. You know, the, the dental problem was one I remember the MP saying to me, you know, the majority of the complaints I get is my residents can't get an NHS dentist. Uh, that suddenly becomes a very real conversation now in each ICB and what are you doing about it what's your local plan and if you do stuff locally I think you'll get more uh, much more innovative ideas around that and trying to find local solutions to that so I think the funding will go there whether you'll see what we've seen with say Manchester and the devolution deal uh, which really is putting stuff down locally I, I think it's probably too soon to tell you know you could look mm -hmm. at the ICB and say well actually this was a way of trying to do devolution and get much more stuff locally between the public sector partners without actually doing the devolution deal. Yeah, yeah. Um, can we virtually create what was created with Manchester's devolution deal? Can we virtually, can we create, virtually that create that up tree and get the public get sector partners around, around the table to do that? Um, but it, it would seem at the moment, certainly in the foreseeable future, moving more money closer to the uh, the systems and close to the patient is certainly the, the, the direction of travel we've seen, and I think that will, I think that will continue. Um, would, would be my my thoughts on that. And we some of the specialist commissioning stuff has come back, and again, these were the services that we used. Really, the local district general hospitals were using. So again, I, I'm not, I don't really think they were specialists in the first place. Yeah, you know, they they may have been specialists at one point, but they've become much more the norm uh, recently. So you know, moving them back in seems seems right as well um, but so, some of the stuff I, I think that did go back up so the true specialist stuff I think should remain there uh, some of the things around some of the prisons and military contracts they, they feel right to be left at I, I think personally at regional sort of level really and build those relationships you know with effectively the, the, the you know fewer organizations there 
but I think you'll continue to see more funding, more stuff get involved on that devolution down to uh, down to your local ICBs. I think is the way it will continue to go. Okay, good. No, that's really really helpful insight. Thank you, because because I, I think some of the conversations are muddled, and I think you know I think you you've described it in a really clear way. So that, I think it's really good. We've come to the end of our time. Thank you, thank you very much. It's been brilliant to get an immersion into the into the the world of general practice integration and the uh, impact of widely wider care, and and also to see how uh, Dorset's continue to evolve with your leadership into uh, continues to be an exciting example of um, of what is possible or what's about to become possible. All those two things uh, taken into account. So thank you very much, Tim, for your time. Thanks for. Giving giving us some really clear kind of answers to the to the questions, um, and and I'd also uh, like to thank the audience for listening, uh, and to say any questions we were asked that uh, we I couldn't ask or um, Tim today. I'd, we'd be very happy to follow up, if, and we'll do that uh, after the webinar. And if anybody needs any uh, help on signposting or advice on what we talked about, then please do get in touch. So thanks everyone. Thanks again, Tim. Yeah, and, thanks. Uh, Look forward to talking to you again soon. Okay, thanks everyone. Goodbye. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to find out more about our work with the NHS or how we could support your market access goals, please email info at mtechaccess.co.uk or visit our website at mtechaccess.co.uk.